Hello and welcome to Fly With Your Shadow, a podcast featuring conversations about the lives of people who make music, including career-based issues like mental health and illness, addictions, uncertainties, and the devastating effect of the COVID pandemic. I'm Jeff Robson, and this show comes to you from my home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Although I cover some pretty difficult ground on this show at times, sometimes it's just nice to have a fun conversation with some of the musicians that have come into my life over the years. Today's guest is one of the most naturally talented and joyful people I've had the great pleasure of getting to know over the years. And I can't wrap my heart. My name is Colleen Brown, and I am a singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist based in Edmonton, Alberta. I play under my own name and also in the band Major Love, which is a collaboration with Scenic Route to Alaska. I've been hosting house concerts since 2009, and I've had some pretty cool people booked to play over the years, and some pretty incredible people have shown up somewhat unexpectedly. In 2016, I kind of lucked into hosting a show by longtime favorites Luther Wright and the Wrongs, along with Ruben de Groot's Rocket Surgery. I found out just before the show that Colleen Brown was coming as well, which made it even more exciting for me. Like a lot of people, I became a fan of Colleen's music based on a song that seemed somewhat inescapable somewhere around 2008. That song is called Love You Baby, and the album that it came from foot and heart was obviously influenced by Joni Mitchell and all kinds of glorious sounds of like 70s AM radio alongside a stunning voice and some powerful lyrics and over the course of about a 20-year career Colleen has carved out a pretty respected solo career but not just that early on she was part of a scrappy garagey punk influenced band called the secretaries featuring the brass holes Later on, she teamed up with another popular Edmonton band called Scenic Route to Alaska. Together, Colleen and the guys from Scenic Route to Alaska formed Major Love, which gave her an outlet for some of her more upbeat, positive, anthemic material. As if that weren't enough, to keep her busy, Colleen recently hooked up with Canadian Roots folk rock mainstays the Great Lakes Swimmers. And right now, as of the release of this episode, she's on tour playing bass alongside Abigail LaPelle, who's promoting a new album of her own. Oh, oh, oh. Sang the night bird to the morning bird Oh, 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 don't you go, don't you go If you're in Winnipeg, you can catch Abigail with Colleen at the West End Cultural Center on April 21st. I hope to see you there. You can find out more information about these songs and projects as well as links to buy them at flywithyourshadow.com. With so much on the go, I had plenty to talk to Colleen about. I read no maps, I make no plans, I take your direction. Take me back, uh, I, I'm always curious how, how decent people like you get mixed up in a crazy mixed up world like music. How, how does that happen? Yeah, I think my parents would rather that I have gone into music education or something. Um, there are many other things that I probably could have done. Um, really early on, I think I 
I knew that I wanted to perform, but I didn't really understand that there was a path for a career when I was growing up outside of being a music teacher, which I had some really fantastic music teachers and drama and art. All of those things were really important to me growing up. So I had some really great role models and really amazing women in particular who were doing those things. So that always felt like something I could do, but I did always have a bit of a drive to be on stage and like just from a very young age in ballet and like making a making myself the center of attention in family gatherings <laughs> getting all dressed up and twirling in the living room that kind of thing so I think that there's a certain p amount of it that is innate and you know I, later in my life I I think I was 12 or so when I started writing but I you know really started taking it seriously later in my teens and um, started to see it more as a vocation um, there are many times when I've wanted to quit and I thought I probably could do <laughs> many other valuable things with my life but it, I always get pulled back in this direction um, it just feels like such a vital space to be able to express yourself and commune with other people and I, I've always felt like that is the real purpose behind all of it is the connection with other people and the sharing of what a beautiful thing it is to be able to live inside of music and spend your time inside of it. You seem like such a such a quiet, introverted, uh, polite person, though. Is it is it hard for you to get up on stage and all of a sudden be, hey, look at me, look at me? I mean, so yeah, I've always struggled with that. Um, but I mean, depending on which part of my career you've been viewing, I guess you might have a different perspective because from about 2005 until 2016 or so, I was a member of a, um, an all-female garage rock band called The Secretaries, um, featuring the brass holes. And <laughs> this was a very loud, um, gregarious, outspoken, um, sort of raunchy band that you know I giggled my way through most of those years so I can't say that I was <laughs> the person stoking the the flames always but it, for me this was a really important um, coming of age like being with these other women who are really strong and outspoken and intelligent powerful people and you know knowing that I had some aspect of that in myself but definitely having come from you know really like catholic conservative upbringing being yeah being a sweet nice girl and then you know there's always some conflict in that i don't think that anyone is truly just one thing in that way but yes i'm an introvert <laughs> was there an element of uh an element of rock and roll rebellion in in uh, getting up on stage and doing some of these things did did you were you kind of fighting against the uh, conservative upbringing or? Yeah, I mean, not so much against my specific upbringing, although I mean, that has shaped everything about who I am. And um, <clears throat> it's undeniable that that's part of it. But yeah, the patriarchy generally, I know like it's not good for anyone. And um, I think that maybe that's, I get these messages from people from time to time that maybe misunderstand what I mean by that and I always like to explain that all of the ways that the patriarchy is you know like that feminism isn't just for women <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah I mean it, it feels obvious to me because I have been steeped in these theories and ideologies that really make a lot of sense to me as a person who feels compassion for all people and wants, you know, equality and justice and um, love. <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, it, it has been misinterpreted, maybe intentionally by, by some political ideologies. And so I think that it's, it is the artistic space to say, hey, this isn't what we mean. You know, we can envision things differently. 
And right now that feels really important. It always has felt important to me, but it does feel more important now. Uh, you talked about the influence of uh, strong women helping you get started. I mean, I mean uh, forgive my, my ignorance and stuff, but obviously there's there's an added challenge in being a woman, especially one who's not quite as outspoken or, or, or is more of an introvert, uh, to, to sort of promote yourself and to become a part of the music community. Did you, did you face a lot of sexist uh, barriers and stuff like that? Did you have to prove yourself, do you think, more than a man would have? Um, <clears throat> I will say, uh, back in the day, in my early years as I was beginning, I was pretty oblivious to those things. And I just accepted that there would be barriers. And, um, you know, it took a while for me to actually, I just, I've always wanted to believe the best in people. And I've always been pretty naive about that stuff. So yes, there were things that occurred or that even occur now that like are kind of unbelievable that they still exist um but <laughs> they're there and it is because we're still swimming in the waters of patriarchy all of us men and women all across you know gender spectrum we have to deal with it as a society and yeah like it, i think it's important that i mean part of what is so amazing about songwriting is that it forces you to look inward and to see your own the ways that you yourself are contributing to what is happening in your life so um <clears throat> and in the world i guess um it it kind of leads me to uh sort of one one of the influences that people pick up on really quickly with you and and you've certainly never shied against it is is uh Joni Mitchell obviously has played a role in your in your life and she would have been like you can't you can't find a better role model for kind of fighting against the patriarchy and and proving yourself and all that stuff than than Joni Mitchell. Can you talk a bit about the uh the importance of her and and her example in your life? Sure. I mean, I didn't really know Joni's music until I went to college and then her her songs were actually part of the curriculum. Um it took me a while to really feel that connection with her but I it was really just getting the right entry point musically um which for me was Court and Spark and then Hijira those two records really just um were uh, just really inspirational and musically they put me on a totally different path so I don't I didn't really know that much about her or her history until later um and I think that I didn't really have an appreciation for what she was up against in the music industry until much more recently. Um, I did read her uh, biography, Reckless, I think Reckless Daughter. Um, that, I guess, yeah, I think that um, there's a lot that you can take for granted if you're not really aware of, you know, how we got here societally and in the music industry there's still all sorts of barriers like um you know I, there are stats about how the number of female artists that get played on the radio versus male identifying artists and um you know there's an ongoing conversation surrounding what constitutes a quote-unquote female artist um and like the, the trying to have some kind of um, equity between artists on festival bills and things like that. So I think that it's really easy to look back at the 70s and, and I mean, anytime you see any kind of retrospective about th those years, the 60s, 70s and on, I think it's just normal in our brains to think that all of music history was made by men and <laughs> there were a couple of women peppered in um, you know, kind of allowed to to be there um, by virtue. I think I. I mean, obviously, I think that it was because she is a profound talent, and you know, wise and <laughs> just really um, undeniable as an artist. But I can't like it. Kind of breaks my brain to think about how many other people could have contributed in some way if they were really just allowed to be seen 
or encouraged to to take that path. So I do think that there's a real sea change in that. It's it's really exploded um, in the last number of years. I I have this real conflict about the streaming services generally and what it means for the music industry, but it's pretty undeniable that there are a lot of artists that are actually making a living from those streaming services. Um, and many of them do identify as women. And I'm, uh, you know, like I'm really conflicted about it because of how it's gutted um, incomes for certain artists. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting time. It's hard to understand where we are and um, um, where we might be going. I think a lot of people still like... There was a time back when I first started in the music industry, like 20 years ago, where people were, it kind of seemed like there was a pathway that was ordained and that you could take to become a successful artist and, you know, the, like a, a structure. Um, and now it really just feels like a Wild West. It's, it's really anybody's guess where everything is going. Um, but there's also undeniably a trend it, like there is in every other aspect of the capitalist system uh, with big companies overtaking the market and drowning out the the middle voices and the smaller voices that's happening in music just as much as anywhere else in our society so are you saying that uh, that you think like streaming platforms in particular, do, do they help level the playing field in a way? Do they do they help other people sort of get ahead in a way that uh, the traditional music industry didn't? Yes. It hasn't helped me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I But I, you know, I'm, I go on these streaming services and I'll listen to some of the new music and there's some just really amazing music. Um, I was listening to a Big Thief album yesterday and, you know, it took me to, after the album finished, it took me to 20 other artists that I had never heard of whose recordings sounded amazing and they were almost all like female represented artists and I just thought okay I'm and they all have you know really significant streaming numbers um and I know yeah it's hard to get to that place but some I I have been hearing about these stats and it kind of feels like you know when you're not in that group it kind of feels like is that really <laughs> the case I'm like I'm, I'm a bit skeptical but that's those are the numbers that I'm seeing so yeah I guess the work is to try to get there well how though like like if the algorithm were were a fair thing then you would think that yours would come up as much as Big Thief or, or whatever so so is it still sort of controlled by some kind of gatekeepers or 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 you know is there is there money behind getting uh, placed yes yes um, like payola exists, <laughs> it just has sort of changed forms. Um, the major record labels have a monopoly and they have all of these systems and levers of power that they use to control the algorithms in their favor. So all of that, I mean, I do feel really skeptical thinking about those entities, uh, but they're not the only ones. And I do see, and I know of personally, other artists on the platforms who have figured out how to do that. And it's a combination. There is something called your uh, popularity index <laughs> on like Spotify, for instance. And it does have to do with all of these stats, like your, it is getting really nerdy. I don't know if you want to go deep into this, but like, yeah, streaming numbers, the people who follow you, how many times they stream your songs, whether they come back again, um, like if they're actively engaging with the release, all of those things can sort of cause this popularity index to rise. And there is a certain number that if you reach it, it's sort of the threshold for you'll be um, you'll begin to be added on algorithmic playlists which kind of contributes to your overall 
potential to get on th those editorial playlists that make or break artists. And that's where, you know, those artists that are getting regularly on the editorial playlists will get many millions of streams with ease <laughs> and the and they're making a living or well they're making real money on on those streaming services whether or not that's a living I don't know because I know a lot of artists also look at that streaming income and say I'm going to use that to make my next recording or to fund my tour you know it's um I guess there are many stages at which you can um sort of plateau as an artist and many artists choose not to tour because touring can be such a financial burden um, but it's also I think what many of us really wanted to do music for in the first place but the 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 sales and stuff that used to come along with touring were a lot more certain like when you when you tour or when you do shows now obviously you're you're not selling albums like you used to right you're selling vinyl and you're selling t-shirts. That's like, yeah. And actually, this is really interesting because I play in Great Lakes Swimmers um, sometimes these days. I, you know, I think of Great Lakes Swimmers as being one of those longtime established artists. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting to see what the trends have been for them because they look pretty similar to what the trends have been for my groups. Um, really, that CD sales are dwindling but people still do buy cds at shows maybe not anywhere else <laughs> but the vinyl is continuously becoming more popular and i think it's partially just as an artifact to you know to say i had this experience and then to keep that souvenir um t-shirts are really similar in that way i think that most music fans understand that they're um part of the interaction is that they they want to support you and to sort of hold on to the feeling of that event so there's always that but I mean I think if the artist does a good job of, in the performance and creates that space that they're often rewarded with people who want to contribute in that way and also to to hold on to that experience so I think that can be a really beautiful exchange there are problems with it. It's not a perfect thing. Um, and there are, for instance, like with vinyl, I know it's a really environmentally wasteful, I guess, system. I just discovered that Precision Disc does um, a carbon neutral vinyl from recycled vinyl. And so actually I have pivoted my most recent, the the new major love record will be this carbon neutral vinyl yeah I'm really excited about that I think that makes a, a lot of sense <laughs> yeah totally this is a new thing there's definitely part of me as like a person who has cared deeply for a very long time about the environment I recognize that there's been all this greenwashing around like plastic recycling and that only nine percent of our recycling of plastic recycling actually gets recycled um, and there's you know, like a lot of greenwashing surrounding that, a lot of misinformation. And there, I think that in my life generally, I try to just not buy things that I don't need and and to purchase secondhand and to use things to the um, until they're no longer useful, uh, which is something that I grew up with. And that's actually part of that conservative upbringing that I find really valuable. Um, but I think there are ways that we musicians are, you know, that we, we have to contribute to that in some way. Um, we have to be really mindful about it, but we also have to make a living. So <laughs> I think there's a lot of push and pull for everyone. I like, I don't know any musicians who aren't really concerned about, about environmental issues. And obviously there are many pressures on all of us that are um, coming from environmental issues right now, like the cost of gas or fuel generally, um, you know, and obviously the cost of food, which is totally tied to fuel prices and also our corporate overlords. 
all of that. <laughs> there are many things to be thinking about and to be concerned about, and all of those pressures are pushing down on all of us who tour in particular. Right. Yeah, it's it's got to be hard because, again, uh, I imagine that's where the majority of your income comes from. And, and I would imagine the majority of the, the joy or the or the reward for what you do would be uh, going and playing for people as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, that is true. I love being on stage and I love even just the being in the van, the social aspect of it, the seeing new places, having new interactions and new experiences um all of that just feels really good to me but i do also know many musicians who are not fond of being on the road and who could probably do totally without it and actually i obviously many people are not touring so um there are different types of musicians and everyone has to just figure out their own path because I know a huge number of people are really living off of sync placements or scoring TV shows or that that kind of work is really like booming right now, <laughs> but also very difficult to get into because it is very saturated. You've regularly made records. I mean, you've never really gone very long without making a record. Is it is it sort of getting harder to, to make sense of, of doing that work or is that just part of what you need to do <laughs> um <laughs> you're outing me here yeah i mean always always i have some kind of um conversation ongoing with myself where i i'm like am i really doing this again <laughs> this is my 10th record between the different projects that i've done over the years the secretaries in my solo project and major love so this major love record that's coming out in may is number 10 and sometimes i think that is insane like <laughs> who who invests this much um <laughs> in something that doesn't necessarily give back in the way that you might hope for it to um, I don't know. I just keep doing it. I keep writing these songs and I keep playing them with people that I love. And then the, the joy that comes from that is something that I can't not share. I always feel like it is my responsibility to capture that and to put it out there. And I, actually, there's always been... A part of me as well that feels like I go into the studio I make something and it's never quite what I want it to be you know it just like always just reaching for not perfection but for this achievement this um this sort of like broad in vision that I have for what I could do as a recording artist um I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I kind of felt like that's what we did with this record. Like we went into the studio, we had enough money because we had, I don't know, this just magically happens from time to time that you get all of the grants that you apply for and then you have all of the funding <laughs> and it's all, and all of the people that you want to work with are available and they all just kind of like, um, converge in your life at the same time and then in this situation we also got a, a residency at the National Music Center and so on top of the grant funding and the plan that we had we were also offered this residency and we sort of changed that into a full recording of the album and at the time like I am as an introspective sensitive person I have always struggled with my own internal um I guess I don't know if it, it's um a lack of self-confidence it's it's probably not a lack of self-confidence but just there are many things that a person has to deal with emotionally when they go into the studio and financial pressure and time pressure are always one of them but I've gotten to this really good place of feeling like I just know that when the moment comes that I need to go and sing the song, I can go and sing the song and 
kind of nail it, which is not something that I've always been able to do in my music career. And I guess, I guess probably self-doubt is part of it, but just getting anxious, getting nervous, getting tight, and then whatever comes out just isn't quite at the level that it, that it could be. And you know, from other people listening, they might think that it's great, but there's, I have my own <laughs> feeling about how I can sing and what it can be. And th- this really is the first time that I've felt like the technical end of it was handled like so effortlessly and so capably and uh, like technical from the recording side of things. It's just a great studio space and Eric Cinnamon, the in-house engineer, was just like so easy to work with and all of the equipment was great (laughs) and yeah just everything worked in this sort of magical way and then what came out at the end I just feel so proud of like it it just has it's one of the first times in my life where I've felt like I kind of hit my mark I did the thing (laughs) so maybe my career is over now um that might be (laughs) I just mean you know like once you've once you've hit your um your goal where do you go from there but I guess you you get a a new goal um since we've talked about major love so much tell me a bit about how that how that band came together like how did you hook up with scenic route to Alaska and and you know how, how did that become such an important part of what you do it, it, this was also kind of a magical thing because we we're both or all from Edmonton and we had sort of crossed paths before, but we had never really talked and we've never really spoken with one another um, in Edmonton. And then we were both separately on tour in the UK and Germany in 2015. And we happened to be both placed on this... Uh, <clears throat> on a bill for a showcase at a bar in London called the Bedroom Bar. And so we were performing on this stage and after the show we just kind of had like a love fest. It was like, <laughs> oh gee, you're so great. Oh, you're so great. That kind of thing. Um and around that time I had just uh I had just found out that I had received a bit of recording funding. And I had this idea in my mind that I wanted to record with a band that was already formed, you know, that they had like a a rhythm section that has their own chemistry. And um, so it just really naturally fell into place that I had booked this recording time. When we all got back to Edmonton, we started working on these songs together and it was it was really effortless. It just all was very natural and immediately clicked and the recordings that came out of that it took us a while to actually finish them it took a few years so they came out in 2018 but um yeah we've been playing and recording as major love ever since and is there a is there a difficulty in kind of starting over under another name? Is there any kind of confusion that that creates between Colleen Brown and Scenic Route to Alaska and Major Love? Or or is that all kind of part of the diversification of, a, you know, a balanced career? Yeah, I mean, there's always confusion. Um, <laughs> but I think, like, I just try to focus on, I mean, I made a very deliberate decision to split my sort of introspective piano-based singer-songwriter project as making that the Colleen Brown project. I do play guitar on that stuff, but it's more singer-songwriter folky. And then making the major love stuff more of that rock band arrangement. And the songs are generally a little bit more on the positive, um, universal side and maybe less directly personal to me um so that's that's where I made this delineation and it was actually after so when I put out my record direction in 2015 there were a couple of tracks on that record soap and denim and Randy Newman that were really 
rock tunes <laughs> that kind of um i mean like they were pretty disparate from the rest of the the record was more like folky singer songwriter and those songs in particular soap and denim is just like it's it's a really in your face rock tune <laughs> and those songs we were part of what we started doing live with this major love project when we um when we started this group because it kind of feels like in hindsight I could have done that before I released that record I could have made that split and it, it makes a lot more sense genre wise to me now and what I do in the live performance setting is is a, a bit separate um yeah I, I I want each experience to be unique from between a major low show and a Colleen Brown show and it does attract a different audience so it's it's something yeah I mean there's definitely crossover but but yeah there's a there are different people different faces at at shows for different groups well nice and then hopefully that spills over and some of those people become Colleen Brown fans as a as a result you know yeah, and I mean, I do perform some of the Major Love songs when I do my Colleen Brown shows. I'd, years ago, I opened for Frank Black of the Pixies um, at a show in Edmonton. And he. this was a really inspiring show for me because I, I realized, like, as an early Pixies fan, um, that, you know, like, he just went up there and did whatever he wanted from all of his various projects throughout the years. And that's who Frank Black is. And that's, you know, that's what he does, whatever he feels like. And <laughs> so I feel like I can do that as Colleen Brown. But Major Love is this other specific entity. It must be a little bit harder to uh, coordinate the schedules. Like, I know those, don't those guys have a new record coming out under their own name as well? Like, it's. They do. Yeah. <laughs> totally. The timing of it has been really funny to watch. They, they can just. Um, like, last week, they, they filmed and then released a music video. Um, my partner was actually involved with this, uh, Dale Bailey. He's the video director who's been doing a lot of the major love videos uh, but he's also done this most recent scenic route to Alaska one and like the turnaround was insanely fast and they are like that with their records as well like I think that this last record it was maybe six months before I like in the time that I heard that they were recording <laughs> and then the time that they were starting to release it um so I I think it's kind of funny um I'm much slower um, I just really take my time. It's it's partially because a lot of the stuff I'm doing on my own and I just have, uh, there's only so much time and energy that I can put into it. Um, usually there's some kind of financial barrier that you, that pushes the, the end zone further and further. Um, that's always kind of an ongoing issue. But anyways, yeah. So we, we are releasing an album within a month of each other. Theirs comes out in April... Um, I think the 11th or something like that. Yeah, so it's theirs is happening really quickly. Um, Murray, the bassist in our in our group, he and his wife had a baby in December. So yeah, <laughs> that's been a big influence on how things go down in our in our band world. Um, but also, uh, they're kind of, they're both musicians. This is Ellen Doty, this is his wife um, and mother. Um, and so between the two of them, I think she's also releasing another record right now. It's kind of insane, uh, all the projects that are going on, like, right at this time. But we're all kind of managing, and we're, and we're figuring out ways to make it work. Um, so yes, you will see that a lot of the tour dates are, they're a little bit disjointed. We have not yet booked our Winnipeg album release. We had a bunch of dates, uh, um, that we've been going back and forth with, but they just kind of, um, started blending into the summer festival season. So we'll wait to see if any of the festivals that we applied for, um, um, what's the word <laughs> come to be, um, but we're pretty booked until the end of June with a lot of Western Canada dates, mostly in Alberta and BC, and a couple of Ontario dates that we're just flying out for. 
and then we're going to make a run east of us later in the fall. Well, it looks like an ambitious kind of uh, kind of uh, release. I mean, you've got all kinds of cool uh, merch items and stuff, and the and the record looks beautiful. So obviously, I got to believe that there's a there's a plan to get out and and play this record and uh, share it with people. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, it is like I said. It's what I love to do, and specifically playing with these guys. I just yeah. It's always been really easy, and I I feel like I they have their hive mind as the three of them, and I just kind of like tap into that <laughs> when I'm playing with them. It's it's really um, it's really something else. Well, tell me a bit about if you've got all these things going on. How do you end up uh, touring heavy with the Great Lakes Swimmers? How does that come about? Well, I started touring with them in the fall of 2019. So I was living in Toronto. I moved there like six months before the pandemic hit. Not great timing. Um, But I had a really, you know, um, lovely tour of Eastern Canada with them, just filling in because their regular keyboardist, Kelsey McNulty, wasn't available. And she has this other project, Good Fortune, which is totally fantastic. And she does these amazing videos for them. Um, So that project for her has started to take off a bit more and she's a little bit less available. So um, yeah, he ended up asking me to, to sit in on this last, the last two tours that we've done this spring and in the fall of 2023 in mostly the United States and parts of Canada. Um, Yeah, it's been really fun. It's been, I just, uh, yeah, I love being on stage. It's really a relief to be a session musician or a side musician and to not be in charge. (laughs) It's so much work to be the person who is leading a group and in charge of all the details, logistics, planning. The administrative side of it is really mind boggling. Um, So yeah, it's it's just really nice to stretch myself as a musician, to be learning all of these parts. I like, I, um, on this last tour, I was playing more of a, not exactly lead guitar, but I was the only electric guitar on stage. So I was playing these more forward, um, lead lines, um, learning, learning how to do that, which is outside of my comfort zone and really stretched me as a musician, felt really good about my progress in that way. Like some of the shows, the early shows were maybe a little rougher, but I really felt by the end of the, by the end of the tour, like I, I had really grown and I'm actually also doing another tour in a couple of weeks with Abigail LaPelle, uh, in Western Canada playing bass in her band, which that's the instrument I I played in the secretaries for those years and years. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting to me. I love playing the bass. It's, it's like, ah. I don't know it's just sitting at a different perspective it's like it's like you're in a spaceship above earth <laughs> that's what it feels like to me when I'm playing the bass I'm really just like observing what's going on in the group and um not as active in it it's it's hard to explain when you uh like being such a um um uh, 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 an artist with a vision who's always done things kind of your own way. Is it, is it hard to suddenly go and fit into somebody else's project or is that kind of a, a bit of a relief for a while to not have to think so much and just do what they want you to do? I think um, in the past I would have had some, you know, ego issue surrounding that. Um, mostly because, you know, I sort of had told myself that if I, that if I am supporting other artists instead of doing my own thing, that, you know, that's taking away from what I could be doing in my own solo career. Um, But I don't believe that anymore. And in part because I have seen how much I've grown musically by by taking part in someone else's vision. Um, and, uh, And for me like just seeing how I'm able to sit within the group dynamic and like growing that ability to really listen to other people musically and interact with them musically 
Um, I've always shied away from soloing, but I've started doing that on this past tour, um, particularly on piano on the or on keys. Um, playing organ, this is another thing that's like it's a whole different discipline from playing piano, which is my background as a musician. That's where most of my training was um, in voice and piano. So yeah, just the growth that I've seen in myself has made it really obvious to me that this is a really positive development for me. And I mean, the fact is that over the years as a solo artist, I've done a lot of other jobs. Um, and just filling in the times when I wasn't able to make it a go of it financially. And that has been everything from like skip the dishes delivery, which was like the worst job I've ever had. Um, and also like after that, I went tree planting for uh, spring and summer in Northern BC wilderness. <laughs> that was the hardest job I've ever done in my life, but also kind of awesome. And um for a few years, I also worked with a music tech company um, in marketing and learned a lot through that as well. So like there are many other ways that I have made a, have made a living over the years that are not exactly being in, you know, being a professional artist. And I would just a million times rather be on stage performing someone else's music and growing as an artist versus like it's I I grew up I grew as a person a, an, a great amount when I was tree planting so I I would never regret that and I but I also it was it's such huge wear and tear on your body um I tore my Achilles and sprained my ankle like a couple weeks into the tree planting season. And it was kind of uh, an ongoing, like every day I was quitting in my brain. And then at the end of the day, I would get this like surge of, you know, whatever chemicals, endorphins or whatever. <laughs> and then I would feel amazing again. And, you know, I guess I just keep, keep planting. So, um, I, yeah, I've done a lot, a lot of other jobs in my life, uh, which I think have contributed to my ability to write about the human experience and to understand other people and to have compassion for other people. Um, so I think that's all really valuable, but I do feel like I belong on stage. Sometimes like I even just like I'm in sound check and, you know, singing into the microphone and this sounds really like arrogant, but I'm, I, whatever. I, when I, am in the zone with my voice, which is most of the time now, it's just kind of naturally there for me. Um, it just feels like the most beautiful expression of being alive. And it, when I'm not doing that regularly, um, it just feels like part of me is closed off. So I, I need to do that. It's, it's part of what feeds me and what makes me feel like I'm on my path. But you still need the the creativity of of making your own thing as well. I got to imagine, right? Like you wouldn't just be happy singing with other people or singing other people's songs. I I think probably not. There might be a, a time at which I do feel that way. I I can imagine that. Um, sometimes I go through these long periods where I don't write anything for a while, and um, you know, usually there's a flip of a switch where I start to want to write again and things come really easily, uh, I kind of go back and forth between those periods. So when I'm writing a lot, I always feel more of a motivation to be doing my own project. Um, but sort of in between projects, when I'm in, there's a, a bit of downtime, I guess that maybe I feel, I, I guess I do feel content to be playing any music just to just to be express expressing my gifts in music. Mm -hmm. You said when you're writing a lot, do you have to set aside time for that? Do you have to force yourself to write? Uh, I don't have to force myself. I just have to open myself. And I and I have found that <laughs> sometimes with what it just depends what is going on in my emotional realm. Sometimes it's easier than others or how like actually 
what I find is the biggest obstacle is if I'm doing too much administrative work, a little bit too much in the um, day to day <laughs> uh, mundane stuff. That's where I generally, and looking at a screen a lot of the day, I, I think that can really interfere with my ability to have the creative flow. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I do, I think it's fully a choice. I, I choose to have my antennae up and to, um, to find meaning or to find patterns. And that's usually where the musical inspiration comes from. So yeah, it's, it, it has always been really easy for me to turn that on and, um, and I also have noticed more and more lately how easily it can be interfered with. Um, you've always done, uh, you've got a real diversity in your catalog. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of obviously folky stuff and there's some jazzy stuff and bluesy stuff. And now, you know, the, the rock and the pop that show up with, uh, with major love, um, can you write for a specific style or does an idea just kind of lend itself particularly to one genre or project better than another? Can you fit in, you know, any song into any project? How, how does that work when you come up with a song? Is it? It's a good question. I don't actually know if I have a real answer for you yet. It's something that I want to explore more. Um, I recently visited Nashville, uh, like in the fall of last year, I went to Americana Fest and... You know, Nashville is the town where everyone goes to basically try their hand at writing for other people, um, which I think if you're going to do that, then you have to be able to write for different styles, for different viewpoints. Um, and I I don't know fully if I can do that because I haven't really tested myself in that area. I would say most of the time I, I have an idea that just comes through, um, like I receive an idea and then I'll, you know, go, I'll, um, allow that idea to sort of play out how it feels that it should. A lot of the time it will arrive with sort of a sonic imprint. Like I know what the vibe is and it came with the original idea of the song. So like whether it's up tempo or a ballad or whether it's you know more minor chords or whether it's one chord or many chords and the genre like all of those things will sort of um arrive there but i also think that they can be modified i i think there's a lot of room for that modification and also the idea of genre has so degraded <laughs> you know like you really can do anything and if you have the right instrumentation or um uh, producing methods then you can you can make it into uh, something else pr really easily i would say but yeah on the other hand also you said earlier i guess that uh, the more introspective or songs more about you were were more colleen brown songs and the the major love songs are more universal or more you have you have some real like anthemic songs of female empowerment and like you know like uh, being happy with your situation in the world and all kinds of great themes and stuff so I, I guess some of those songs are more naturally suited to one of those projects yeah i i um i came up with the name major love as sort of that like my it's my mission <laughs> like I I know it sounds a bit cheesy but it's kind of like why not why not have a project where you put all of your effort towards you know this is supposed to feel good and it is intended to to be loving and compassionate and to make people like to bring people together under that banner I think it's a really easy thing to to want to rally under <laughs> and and it kind of naturally uh, occurs between us as as a member of the band each of us as members of the band so yeah i think that that just always has felt like a good starting point for figuring out how all the pieces fit together 
I mean, it's not a perfect thing either. There's, um, I mean, it just depends how you define these subjects because one of the songs that we're about to release, um, I guess just, you know, over a week, it's called Time. Um, it talks about death. Um, it's talking about, you know, like a, a sense of losing time and getting older. And it's not exactly like... Uh, heartwarming topic <laughs> for most people um but i also like i think there's so there's beauty to be found in that and you know the inevitability of our death and what value comes from knowing that our time is um you know that each of us will die at some point it, the um the preciousness to use the word that i use in the song um of life so it's not an easy subject for me it's pretty um it's tied to some like heavy personal things that have occurred or um losses that i've had but it's also that's universal all of us know what that feels like so that's that's the magic for me is when you know i i'm not a writer i i i can't write but when somebody writes something that kind of helps me to process things or understand how i'm feeling i often find that you know writers like you can say things uh can express my feelings better than i can that's what i always hope for <laughs> thank you <laughs> i mean i i early on in my life i really struggled to express anything i i came to songwriting in part because I always felt inadequate in the way that I was able to express to other people what I was feeling or even to understand my own emotions. For many years I didn't think I was capable of being angry and really truly I it was deeply repressed <laughs> and it's been quite an exploration in these recent years to discover a that I have the ability to be angry and B, that anger can be beautiful and um, validating and, and more than anything, it is true. It is there. And um, I think that it's uh, necessary for all of us to get, you know, really to be really authentic to it doesn't mean to lash out at somebody, but it does mean to acknowledge that this is happening and this is what I feel. And uh, um yeah, I think that all of society would benefit when we do that kind of work for ourselves. Like we're just really honest with who we are and what we're feeling. And then maybe all of us could uh, do some work at being better at expressing, <laughs> you know? So uh, like I think uh, I, I probably all of us identify with ways and times that we have not expressed our emotions well and have hurt other people. And, you know, that that's good fodder for a song. Um, <laughs> and I sure do write about it. Well, it's, uh, it's exciting. I can't wait to hear some of these new songs. Can you remind me again sort of when these things come out and, and what's the album called? And The album is called Live, Laugh, Major Love. And this is um, mostly because we were staying at an Airbnb in Calgary when we were recording this album at the National Music Center there and it was just full of that like chuggy um, live laugh love uh, I just can't without my coffee uh, wine, <laughs> like whatever wine related um, you know just like over the top um, and it just felt like the right thing um, yeah I'm really excited about this record. And actually, I also just want to, like, when you see the photos that came out of it, I'm so stoked about these photos because um, Kaylee Thomas styled and directed um, this photography session and Ryan Parker did the photos. Um, ah, I've <laughs> I just feel really good about, like, the visual expression uh, as well as the musical expression and I know I'm I feel kind of like I'm late to this game of realizing how important the visual expression of your music can be for other people to to relate to you as an artist and to um to connect with it but yeah the videos that we're doing and I, I just yeah I hope that other people I hope that everyone will go and look at them because I think that 
what we were able to create with all of our, our various collaborators. Um, I'm just really proud of it all. As we were wrapping up our chat about Colleen's career journey, she reminded me about a frightening accident that happened recently while on tour with the Great Lakes Swimmers. This incident highlighted some of the uncertainty and inherent danger that comes with the life of a touring musician, which is kind of what we talk about on this show. Yeah, I mean, this was one of those events that you, from time to time, hear about happening to other people and you just assume will never happen to you or anyone you know. Um, (laughs) We were in Nashville. um, We had a night off before our show there at the city winery and... Our bassist, uh, we were all, we had all gone out for a night of music on Music Row um, and had left Roberts was the place that we were hanging out and then um, walking up Music Row and at a crosswalk with all of the traffic stopped and this bicycle came just careening down a hill and hit our bassist, Nick, um, and just and knocked him unconscious and, you know, blood everywhere. Just like a really scary, intense scene. Um, Yeah, and this was, you know, close to the end of the tour. Uh, We had only four more shows left before heading back to Canada. So this was, um, yeah, a really intense situation. We spent, I mean, he was in the hospital um, in emergency for a few days before we were able to transfer him back to Canada. We did sort of a marathon trip from Nashville up to Guelph to drop him off at home at 3.30 in the morning. (laughs) Um, uh, So we had to cancel a couple of days on the tour. Uh, Tony and I actually ended up doing the one date in Nashville as a duo, and then we uh, came back to Ann Arbor to close the, the final of the tour dates there with a, um, well the regular bassist in the group um, and another drummer that we've performed with quite a bit um, yeah so it just was a really crazy random it was like seeing someone be hit by lightning it was the most random strange act um, that like it really has me thinking about I mean, I always am thinking about the nature of life and the precarity of our um, physical form here um, and the preciousness of life. But it, yeah, when something like that happens and I, I was just like two paces behind him, could have been me, could have been anyone. And luckily now um, we, are, we know that he is going to be okay At first, we thought he would have to have, like, major surgery. Um, What we also are discovering now is that um, his insurance may not be covering everything. So we're sort of uh, (laughs) in this limbo space of, and I think this happens with musicians all the time, like, you buy the insurance and you're you're expecting that nothing bad will happen but if you do have to use the medical system in a foreign country um it's kind of a nightmare and although th- this was these were all really great professionals that we were dealing with and they did a really great job with him and i'm really grateful for even like at just at the scene there were there were two nurses that just happened to be there at the scene who were able to help us like right away from um yeah from that moment when it all occurred um but yeah it was uh (laughs) just totally new territory and I still feel kind of like it was this out of body experience like maybe I wasn't even actually there it was kind of a dream and I'm sure that for Nick it's kind of been a similar um experience I don't know how much he wants other people to know about although I know he's been canceling a bunch of shows that he was supposed to do and announcing that he has you know he had a brain injury so I think uh it's out there that this this happened but we haven't really talked about it you know like I don't we don't really know how to talk about this kind of thing and it's I I know that there have been instances where like a lot of 
um, like it can really derail an artist when something like this happens or a, a person who is in this situation. It can be the band that is derailed. It could be the specific person who's sustaining those injuries that is derailed. And for, for Nick, I'm sure that it is, um, yeah, like an intense, it, all of this is an incredibly intense and life-changing experience. So, I mean, it just, it all gets me back to, um, it brings me back to sort of the original point of like, what do I want to be doing with my life on this planet? And I, this is absolutely what I feel like I'm here for. Um, so scary stuff happens sometimes, um, but it also kind of makes it just reaffirms what it is that is important. Yeah, it it also highlights how uncertain and um, sort of precarious your line of work, though, is. I mean, that kind of stuff could happen to any of us. You know, if that happened to me, I would be able to get time off because I have that, you know, built into my job. But when you're living in a in a in an industry where you have to work and there's no there's no paid sick time or anything, that's that's got to be even scarier and and more uncertain. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I guess that probably it's much more common to be in a car accident or something like that because you're on the road all of the time and it, that is a dangerous activity to be doing. Um, you don't generally think of walking across the street as being a super dangerous activity, especially when you're in a high density populated area where, you know, there were a, more than a dozen people crossing the street at that time. So it was... It just felt even more <laughs> random and and um, crazy because of that. Um, yeah, there's. <laughs> it just it is exactly the kind of thing that could happen to anyone anywhere at any time, and um, I think that yeah, that randomness kind of drives it home that this is can't take anything for granted. And yes, sure, there are risks, but. There, I mean, you hear more and more about the risks of sitting at a computer all day or just sitting all day and how bad that is for people. So, I mean, the cumulative effects of having a desk job versus being able to go out and commune with other music lovers <laughs> on, a daily, on a daily basis. I mean, I know what I choose. <laughs> The bass player for Great Lakes Swimmers, who we're talking about there, is a guy named Nick Zubek. He has some pretty incredible music of his own, which I've now become enamored with. You know I struggle to For the energy To push on through When I only see the blue I think of you. There's currently a GoFundMe campaign on the go to help Nick recover from his accident and pay off his lingering bills. You can find the link to that as well as information about and links to buy all of his music and all of the music used in this episode at flywithyourshadow.com. If you like any of the music that you heard or we talked about today, you'll surely enjoy my radio show, Tell the Band to Go Home. You can hear that at tellthebandtogohome.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Fly With Your Shadow is and always will be free and without ads or any requests for money. The one thing that you could do to help support the show is to share this episode with people who might enjoy it. Growing the audience is the biggest challenge for the show, so your help would be greatly appreciated. If you would take a moment to tell someone about the show or share a link with your followers and friends on social media, it would help a lot. I love hearing from listeners. If you have any questions or comments or feedback or suggestions, drop me a line at flywithyourshadow at gmail.com. My name is Jeff Robson, and I sincerely thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope you'll join me again on the next episode of Fly With Your Shadow. Fly with your shadow.